Going off to college, I expected to learn many things. The one thing I did not expect to learn was to how to move. I moved seven times in eight years. Has everyone here moved at, one, at least once in your adult lifetime? Yes, okay. So y'all know that there's this moment in moving that's not, while it's not enjoyable, it's at least a moment of satisfaction. This moment when you've moved everything out and you have cleaned, and in my case, I'm cleaning for my deposit, which means I'm cleaning in ways I never clean. I was scrubbing baseboards. Anyone here scrub baseboards? You are better people than I am. The only time I've ever cleaned a baseboard in my life is when I'm trying to get my money back. And so there's this moment when everything is packed and out, and you have scrubbed the baseboards, and you look at the room, and it is clean and empty. And it's this moment before you walk out, drive to where you're about to move in, and everything about, is about to go. Because you're going to start, yes, the, the moving in. But, but just to stay in that moment of that clean and empty. It's a clean and empty house. What happens to an empty house if you leave it empty? Right? Clean, empty, just sitting there. It's an odd thing. You wouldn't think it'd be an issue. But if you leave a house empty for too long, things just start to happen. I, I remember um, living up, up in Mile and I would drive to Kirksville at least once a week. And, and there was a, a single wide trailer on the north side of, of Six between uh, Greencastle and Novinger. And, and it, someone had moved out, out of it about the time I, I went to Milan. And no one ever moved in. And so for the next seven years, I drove past this trailer. And for some reason, it just caught my eye. And uh, about a year in, a window broke on one end. And then once the window broke, then the siding started to rot around it. And you know how this unfolds, right? By the time I left, that single wide trailer, one end of it was just collapsing on itself. It was an empty, clean building, and it just was falling apart. An empty building, no matter how clean, is a bad idea. So Jesus is talking about an empty building today. I wanted us to think about what we know about that so that we can, we can get to what Jesus has to say. Jesus, get, start, the way he gets to that is first he heals someone. He casts out a demon that, that was causing a person to be uh, mute, mute, could not talk. And people around him start muttering. And it's, what we read in scripture is, it says, and people said that he casts out demons by Beelzebub. But we know that's not actually, it's not like Jesus was standing here healing this person. And another person like walked up and said, I think you're casting out demons by Beelzebub. Because that's not how crowds work, is it? Think about when you're at a high school football game and the coach is not putting in the star athlete and he's just not doing it and not doing it and not doing. What happens to that crowd? Hey, what? This just starts that muttering that just sort of moves through a crowd. That's what's happening here. Someone in the crowd starts saying, you know, he must be a demon to be able to do that. Yeah, it takes one to know one. You know, I hear he actually prays to Baal. I mean, you can just start hearing the muttering that's going through the crowd. That's just sitting there watching. They don't think Jesus can hear, but he can. Just like that coach can hear, too, at that high school game. And so Jesus turns to the crowd, and he, he responds, and he starts pointing out that a, a house divided against itself would fall, that he couldn't be casting out demons in the name of a demon, but if, if he's casting out demons in the name of God, then the kingdom of God has come near, so you best pay attention. And then Jesus goes on to talk about, now that he has the crowd's attention, because they're not muttering anymore. They're just, zip, they've, they've been called out. They, they're paying attention. And so, Jesus goes on to talk about what happens after a demon has been cast out, when a person has been healed. He says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through the waterless regions looking for a resting place, but not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from whence I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. 
Now we have to figure out what to make of this. Because Jesus is talking about demon possession and spirits and houses, and how do we handle this? It is tempting, admittedly, to just kind of gloss past this. I mean, demon possession, not a common topic of discussion most times today. Right? But this is what Jesus is saying, so I think we need to stop and pay attention and take this seriously. Like how, so how do we take it seriously that Jesus is talking about demons without turning into a weird discussion of exorcism? Which, we don't actually have an order for exorcism in the Methodist Book of Worship. I did check. Um, so, I think we first we notice that this story is not literal. Like, this is not meant to be taken literally. Jesus has just healed a person, right, just now. Healed a person, and now he's speaking after having cast this demon out. And so he's talking about a, a person's house being put in order. It's the person who was just healed. And a person, when someone's person's house is put in order, just like this, life has, this guy's life has been made possible again, because he can talk again, like we see the connection there. But what about the demon? People in the first century, just like today, have to grapple with sicknesses and problems that we cannot touch, but are very real. Right? I cannot touch depression, but it has swallowed a good friend of mine. I cannot hold bipolar in my hand, but there's a dear friend who is just mired in it up in Chicago, a good friend of mine. I cannot put narcissism in a jar. I can't bottle greed. I can't make slices of PTSD and stack them up. These things are not corporeal or tangible. They have no weight, and yet they have such a weight, right? These things are real. They are real today, and they were real back then. Right? What do we call these things today? What's the terminology we use? Talk about mental disorders or mental diseases or sort of lesser, like if someone obsesses of an anxiety, maybe it's a character flaw, I don't know, as someone who obsesses, OCD. Like we have terminology for how we talk about these things today. What would they have said 2,000 years ago? They don't have the language of science and medicine. But we look at when Jesus throws, uh, Jesus heals a child who is throwing himself into the fire. Like when a child collapses and throws himself into the fire, what, what would you think that is today? What would you call that? Epilepsy? Some sort of seizure, right? What did they call it then? Demon possession, right? Because they had to figure out a way to name something that was real. But they didn't, they had to figure out what to call it. What's the terminology? And, and so if you look at a person and if you say that person is burdened with addiction or you say that same person is demon possessed, yes, same thing, right? It is destroying a person's life and it's healing that is needed. And so what we hear Jesus talking about is using the cultural assumptions of the day. Like, Jesus can only use the words that people are speaking. Like, if Jesus had looked at the, the child who had fallen down and, and thrown himself into the, the fire and said, it looks like this child is uh, having uh, epileptic seizures, would anyone have understood what that meant 2,000 years ago? Right? That, that's not, it wasn't possible to say those words. They had not been invented yet. What the words in the language language they had were that they had these demons that have a sense of purpose and when they're cast out they wander in the desert and that multiple demons can, can possess a person. Multiple demons. You ever see someone treat depression by starting drinking and then they have both uh, depression and addiction, right? This, this is the language that was used to describe something that is real. This is probably a good point for me to pause and say, I am not a psychologist. I am not a counselor. I am reading scripture as faithfully as I can, but I, I reserve the right to be wrong. And if I exercise it in the next couple minutes, please forgive me. But uh, I just want to make sure, like, we're, this, is, is everyone is understanding this? Like, this is what we're getting at here. So Jesus is talking about healing a person 
casting out a demon, and describes this person once healed as being an empty house that is put in order. And, and the emptiness there, it, it's actually a participle. It's not just being empty. It, it's, it's leisurely. Leisurely being empty. It's like having a, a big old empty house and taking a lazy boy chair, putting it in the middle of it, and kicking back and relaxing. Right? And just sort of luxuriating in the emptiness of it. Except what happens to emptiness? It always gets filled, right? Once the demons have been cast out, once this person ha has been uh, healed, what happens next? What Jesus tells us is that the spirit goes forth, finds seven other spirits, bring them back, and the person is worse off than they had ever been. And seven, the number of completion in scripture. The, the person is like completely destroyed. What does that sound like? What's the word we would use for that today? Someone who has a mental problem, a mental disease, a mental challenge, and, and they seem to get their lives together, they get some help, they get some counseling, and, and then something happens. It's a relapse, right? And so for the seven spirits to come back, this is a relapse. I have watched relapses. I have seen the carnage that has been caused by, by them, the angst, the concern, the worry that a family bears when someone they love falls, and, and then, thank God, they're, they're, they're better, and then they fall again, and they fall, and they were worse than they ever had been. I, I have watched a landlord... Someone who owned multiple buildings and cared for people by providing these buildings for the good of the community. This person had a, a drastic surgery and could never get off the pain medication. And, and now the... Now the landlord is homeless in Kansas City. I, I've seen depression swallow a person, and, and you think that they're back to normal, and, and I get excited because my friend is back, and, and, and there is someone I've been trying to call all year, and I've not been able to get my good friend on the phone. Depression has swallowed that. I know of a family that watched a, a son go through major depression and, and self-treat through alcohol, and then they got a job, and like getting a job, getting his life back together, and, and, and now is not. And now the son has moved away, and they do not know, and it is hard. If you call it spirits coming back, or you call it a relapse, I believe it to be the same thing. And there are a few things that are scarier. What Jesus is getting at is that those with problems that are rooted in what we cannot touch, whether we call them demon possession or psychological issues, it is not enough to empty and clean the house. We must fill up our inner lives with something good to take the place. Right? This is what Paul reminds the church at Colossae. He tells the church, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. People tell you these things, but they are, are of no value. Like the idea of just telling someone to stop. You ever tell, you ever know someone who really struggles with anxiety and worry, and you look at them and just say, just stop worrying? Does that ever work? <laughs> it doesn't, right? If I want to help you quit smoking, what do I do? I get you a subscription to Nicorette. It's not quit smoking, it's start chewing this. We know how this works. We know how it works in other parts of our lives. It's not enough to say, stop being greedy. If, if a person is struggling with being greedy, I'm not going to look at them and say, stop being greedy. What I'm going to say is, start a practice of intentional generosity, and it's going to be really hard. But start something good. Don't try to not be, have greed in your house. Try to fill up your inner life, your house, with a practice of generosity. That's why we pass the plate weekly. We've got to practice it. Right? We've got to fill up our lives with these good things. It's not enough to empty the house. We've got to fill it up. And this is when Jesus calls people, Jesus says to follow me. Right? To follow and to do these things so that you fill up your life with the fruit of following me. The fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, notice the language of spirits, right? This fruit of the spirit. I can't touch love, but I do need it. I, I can't touch joy, but I hope to cultivate it, right? I, I can't bottle patience, 
I'm the father of two small children, right? <laughs> Patience, yes. I, I need to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit and be receiving that daily from, as a gift from Jesus in, in my own life. Our own homes and lives are going to be full of something. No house is going to sit empty, and so it will be filled, and we choose how we're going to respond to that. I don't think that... Any one of us can fix our inner lives by ourselves. If we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. But what we can say is that we are responsible for responding to the state of our inner lives. Right? We are responsible for responding to where we are internally with the parts of our lives that we cannot touch but are very real. And we, we can respond by filling ourselves. I think one of the healthiest things we can do is fill our, our inner lives up with scripture, specifically the Psalms. The Psalms narrate how to practice praise and joy and pain and grief. If, if you haven't read the Psalm that says God bashed their children's babies' heads against the rocks, right? It's in there because sometimes you're that angry. And how do we handle our anger, our inner life, and put it before God? How do we read the Psalms and read the parts of the Psalms where it's, I am in darkness, but I'm going to find you. That's in the Psalms. How do we find the confession, I, the struggle with, with my own sense of, I have fallen. And we read, it's in Psalm 51. I have fallen, Lord, but there is grace. To read the Psalms is to help to fill our lives up with ways to handle uh, our inner lives that, that are healthy. And there are times that we're going to need help to do this. I am responsible for this, my, where I am internally, responding to it. That doesn't mean I can fix myself. When I was uh, tra being trained as a chaplain, I spent more time handling my own stuff than actually serving the people in the hospital, talking to the chaplains there, because I need help hand handling my inner life. You think I have it all put together? I got you fooled. <laughs> right? I have my own baggage. I think I have things that I need help with. There is a depressive streak that runs through my family that is deep, a, a, a major de like major depression. And I greatly respect, uh, I am proud of the members of my family have, who have chosen to handle this to the point that some of them have needed and sought uh, medication, right? To seek out a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist to, to seek medication, if that is what it takes to handle our inner lives, that is being responsible for filling our, our lives up with, with joy and peace. Like it is, it is a good thing to do this. As I said, we are responsible for responding to where we are in our inner lives. And if they're not in good shape, whether it be from the severe challenges, bipolar, depression, to, to something more like something more common like apathy and worry, there are ways to respond. There are practices to, to, to take on. There are ways to fill our lives with what is good and healthy and whole. This is part of our response when Jesus says, follow me. Jesus doesn't look at us and say, follow me when you have everything put together. Jesus says, follow me and we'll get better along the way. Fill up your life with me. And, and as we do so, what I believe we find is that Jesus, what he says is true, that the burden that he asks us to carry is light, that the journey that we take is towards a fill, fullness of life that is good and true, and it is, it is in that that we find our hope, that our inner lives, our homes, uh, who we are can be filled, can be helped, and in the end can be healed. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.